My name is Joanna Perry and I am the North Somerset's Rewilding Champion um, Project Assistant for um, Avon Wildlife Trust and it's in partnership with North Somerset Council. Um, it's doing really well and other councils in the area are following suit. Um, so the council have given 25% of their amenity grassland back to nature in the hope of helping with climate change and boosting biodiversity numbers. As you know, today is wildflowers. We have also um, completed Bees of the UK, Grass ID and Butterfly ID, which is available on um, um, Avon Wildlife Trust site and North Somerset Council, they're linking soon. Um, and it's also on YouTube, so do feel free to um, have a look at those. I'm just going to share my screen a second so that you can um, have a look at the presentation. So, uh, hang on. Ooh, here we go. Um, there are ways to record wildflowers, of course. You've got the iNaturalist, iRecord, and the British Society for Britain and Ireland. Um, each county has a BSBI recorder. And of course, if you join this particular project, you can help um, us record the, the data in North Somerset Council for North Somerset. Council. Um, this is a really good book. It's The Wildflower Key by Francis Rose. You can also get the Collins Wildflower book. That's a very good book too. Um, so just got to talk a little bit about the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. It is a criminal offence to uproot any wild plant without the landowner's permission in particular protected species. And this includes bluebells and orchids and, and many others. <clears throat> the general rule from um, the Francis Rose Wildflower Key is to take the book to the plant and take photos rather than taking the plant to, book, to the book. Uh, we can't conserve wildflowers or their habitats until we know what we have got. And the need to survey is crucial for plant survival. So if you really would like to join the surveys next year, they start in March and they run till September. The importance of wildflowers. So meadows are a mixture of wildflowers and grasses. Ecologically, the structure is providing a three-dimensional habitat, um, which many insects feed on the grass seeds, as well as pollen. Meadows offer cover from predators and nesting areas. If you have a good look, you will find many tiny pollinated insects amongst the grasses. And this is one of our sweep nets surveys. Uh, we sweep net the long grass, the moan, and the tree planted areas, and we count all the insects. And during the summer months, we did count quite a few. So, um, Wildflowers depend on what different soil types there are. So high soil nutrients produce tall grasses and large wildflowers, whereas low nutrient soils produce smaller plants and wildflowers. And um, there's many sites of special scientific interest in North Somerset Council. I've listed a few, uh, Breendown, Cleave Hill, Walbrook Common, Portbury Wolf, and the, uh, there are many more listed on the Avon Wildlife Trust's website. So biodiversity lines. Bug Life has teamed up with many organisations around the country. Um, they are in partnership with Avon Wildlife Trust. You can see here from the map, there is um, biodiversity lines all over North Somerset Council. Um, 
the efforts of North Somerset Council recording areas are contributing to these wildlife corridors because all the rewilding that has been created um, with contractors managing it um, is all benefiting the insects and pollinators connecting wildlife corridors for them to get around from the coast to inland. So, should we talk about some common wildflowers? All right, firstly, um, let's discuss some sunshade, wet or dry. So, in sunny areas, you can have bladder campion, which is a perennial plant, um, and you can see it May to September. It prefers calcareous soil, grasslands, roadside and roadside margins, and it attracts bees, butterflies and hoverflies. In shady areas, you'll see British bluebells. Do not mistake them from, for the Spanish bluebells. Um, they do hybridize sometimes. Um, there is a very lovely spectacular view of bluebells in a place called Priors Wood, which is in Tickenham. So please do have a look in the spring. It's a proper carpet of wildflowers there. In wet areas, you can get devil's bit scabious. They do go on the dry, dry meadows, but they're also seen in the wet. Um, the devil's bit scabious is um, usually seen between June and September. And a little fact about the name, apparently um, people thought that the root was bitten by the devil, and devil's bit scabious. And lastly here, we have dry areas, which um, betony um, can grow in dry areas in the sun and the shade. Um, you can see it between June and October um, in the grass and road verges. It's a perennial and it thrives in both sunny and shady areas. And so I'm going to go through some daisies for you. It's the largest family of wildflowers and can include daisies, ragwort, sunflower, flea veins, pineapple weed, and thistles. I'm just gonna talk about a couple of these initially. Um, flea bane is a frequent perennial. Um, another name for it is pig daisy. Um, it is actually a repellent to insects, um, so not particularly good for this project but you can see it between July and September um, and it's found in ditches and roadsides. It's this plant here. Um, yeah. And so next we have the pineapple weed, which does actually smell like pineapples. Um, it's an introduced species that has naturalized here. Um, and it's found alongside pavements and road verges. It's a composite flower. Its flower head is made up of individual flowers and appears to have no petals. So I'm gonna go through dandelions, hot bits and hot beards because they all do look similar. Um, they all have yellow flowers but as you can see here, the dandelion has many more petals than both the hawkbit and hawkbeard. And the hawkbit and hawkbeard also have little cups on the end of their petals. A really good way of differentiating them, having a good look at all the flowers. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail about dandelions. They don't have many hairs. Their leaves are tubed or pinnatified. They have these jagged leaves on either side of the leaf. Um, in the stem, there's a milky sap that it doesn't taste very nice. Trust me, I've pried it accidentally. Um, <laughs> um, it is an early food source for pollinators. I know people don't like it, gardeners don't like it, but it is definitely essential in the winter months for pollinators. <clears throat> Cat's ear hawkbit. It has a basal rosette and hairy leaves. 
you can see it between June and September. And the bracts here, you can clearly see they're the bits that protect the flower. It's a perennial and it grows on dry grassland. The name comes from the densely hairy leaves and mowing actually stimulates the flowers to grow. So the more you mow it, the more flower heads you get. Which is the same with the rough hawk spear, actually. Um, it grows many flower heads. You can see it between June to August. It has rough and hairy stems and pinatified leaves again. Um, it is a native perennial and, and also obviously yellow. Next we have common knapweed. Common knapweed has slim lined leaves that are not pinatified. You can see them in June and September and they're a definite favourite for pollinating insects. This is a fact that bees actually are attracted to yellow and purple flowers because they can see them. <clears throat> it's also known as black knapweed to many people. Um, here you have greater knapweed, which does have a pinatified leaf. Not many jagged sides to it, just a couple. And it flowers June to September, and it's also a perennial. Meadows are mainly made up of perennial flowers. Um, not some annual, but mostly perennial, and that's how it carries on. Okay, now buttercups. Um, buttercups are their own family. Um, I've got a three here, but there's a fourth on the next page. So you can identify them by bulbous buttercup has the reflex sepals. Their sepals are inside out. They don't protect the petals. Um, that's a really good way of identifying them between the others. The meadow buttercup and creeping buttercup, both their sepals press against the flower. Mm. There is a lesser known buttercup called the Goldilocks buttercup. Um, and these are the different leaves for each one. The meadow buttercup leaves divided into three segments, three lobes or five lobes. And the creeping has triangular leaves, which have deeply cut lobes. And the bulbous leaves also have three lobes. The end one has a clear stalk on the base. Next slide, we go to the orchids now. The seeds of orchids do not store enough food, so they need help by mycorrhizal fungi. This is a symbiotic relationship, mutualistic symbiotic relationship. Uh, the orchids are completely dependent on their life cycle with the fungi, and the fungi helps by being protected by the roots and it's their food source as well. Um, so here we've got autumn ladies tresses, which I haven't come across yet. It's quite rare. Um, it's seen between August and October. And the leaves are at the base um, and they actually die back when the flowers come. Apparently it has a coconut scent to it. And next we have the bee orchid, which is, um, you can see it between June and July. It's more common. Um, it has rosette leaves at ground level and it's quite a sneaky mimic. Um, it likes to pretend it's a female bee and it is even a little bit hairy. Um, so the male bees come along and pollinate it, however, in the UK, um, the bee orchid actually self-pollinates, so um, it doesn't actually need the deception that it has. Um, 
Next, we have the pyramid orchid, which I've seen on roundabouts and road verges. It does pop up everywhere. Uh, you can see it between June and July. Um, it's densely packed with little pink flowers. Um, <clears throat> and it attracts a range of butterflies and moths. You, okay. And it's hairless. This is the early purple orchid. Um, it gets its name because it appears early in the year between April and June. It's a scented flower. It likes woodlands, grasslands, and acidic rich soils. And it uh, attracts day flying moths and bees. The common spotted orchid is quite tall. It has transversely oblong purple spots. Oh, yes. Um, so transversely means widthwise. And so you're, that's a good way to differentiate it from the early purple, actually, because the spots are shaped differently. It attracts day flying moths and it's found in woodlands, grasslands and acid rich soils. Next, we have the carrot family. Now, this is a very confusing family. It's quite large and all the flowers look the same. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk about a few on here. They're called umbellifers because of the umbrella shaped flower head that they have. Um, firstly, I'll talk about the cow parsley up here. It has fern like leaves. Um, and you can see it May to June. Um, it is similar to the hemlock leaves, so do not mistake it for it because the hemlock is poisonous and cow parsley isn't that poisonous. Um, orange tip butterflies and hoverflies like this plant and it grows on roadsides and verges. Next, I'm going to talk about this little one, this pignut. Um, it's around from May to June and it likes dry grassland. It has small umbels and attracts soldier beetles and butterflies and hoverflies. Uh, wild Angelica um, has hollow stems, it gives off a lovely scent and its lower leaves are divided. You can see it between July and September. It's found in damp grassland and the large umbella for clusters have a tinge of purple on the flowers and they're attractive to a variety of insects. Okay, so the next slide, it's wild carrot. Now this one has a cute little purple flower right in the middle of its umbrella for head. Um, this is mainly to attract insects. Um, you can see it between July and September. It's wide, a widespread perennial with frilly leaves. You can see it here, the frilly leaves. Um, but surprisingly, it doesn't actually produce carrots. The leaves do smell carrot-like, but the roots do not turn yet orange. <laughs> Next, we have the hemlock, which here you can see the fern-like leaves. It has purple spotted stems, so that's how you can differentiate it from cow parsley and it's a biennial, which means that it takes two years to complete its re reproductive life cycle. <clears throat> um, apparently, the toxin in hemlock, hemlock can cause paralysis in livestock. It can give a skin reaction to us, so basically don't go near it. Giant hogweed. Now, this is a very invasive non-native plant. It can grow up to 10 meters and even the flower heads can be um, like two foot across, quite large. Um, and it's a photosynogenic um, invasive plant. So if you get the sap on you, 
then you can have blisters form and it's very dangerous in the sunlight because every time the sun is on the skin, the blisters will come back. So please do not go anywhere near giant hogweed. It flowers between June and August and um, it disperses seed in the water, seeds in the water and pesticide is a way of managing it. Now this is our native hogweed, it's not as invasive. Um, you can see it between May and September, it doesn't quite grow so tall. Um, a few other names of it are Limbus scrimps, Gypsy's Lace, I quite like cow bumble. Um, although similar looking, the stems are not blotchy like the giant hogweed. Um, the colour of the stem gradually smooths from green to purple and it's hollow and hairy. Ooh. Next, we go to the pea family. I love the pea family. Uh, firstly, we have white clover in the top corner. It's quite a common plant. You do see it in your lawns and um, oh, parks everywhere. Um, you may see it between May and October. Uh, the trefoil leaves, which means three leaves, um, have white markings on them um, and the they're food plants for the common blue butterfly and various bumbles. Um, also we have spotted medic. Um, spotted medic has black marks on the heart-shaped leaves, which is cute. And you can see it on roadsides and margins in between May and September. It's a spring germinating annual. Also, I've got gorse here. Gorse, even though it's a pea, it's also classed as scrub. So when you've got a site of science, special scientific interest um, and it's a grassland site, Natural England will actually ask you to reduce the amount of gorse that is on the site because they only allowed 10% scrub. But it is a very nice plant um, and really great for habitats for birds and other mammals, other mammals and mammals. So <laughs> next we have bird's foot trefoil. This is one of the first plants that I learnt. Um, and it also goes by the name eggs and bacon because of the colouring of the flower, it's yellow and pinkish. Um, the seed head is shaped like a bird's foot, which is how it gets its name. You can see it between May to September and the flowers look like slippers. Um, it is a very important food source for bees and butterflies. Next we have rust tarot, which um, is a very lovely tall pea. Um, you can see it between July and September. It's a creeping perennial. It has a really tough root system, rhizome root system, and it's pollinated by bees and a very good plant, again, for the common blue. As you can see in the photos, it's incredibly hairy and it has white petals that turn pink. And here we have the kidney vetch. It's a very small ground covering flower. You can see it between June and September and it has this woolly appearance about it. The yellow flowers sit atop a woolly cushion, which um, each flower has a hairy calyx. Uh, the sepals of the flower enclose the petals, which give it a protective layer. And a fact about it is it's traditionally used to treat the kidneys, hence its name. Now we've got the meadow vetching. You can see it between May and August. It's quite a creeping plant. It will climb. 
Um, it's also another name for it is fingers and thumbs. It has black seed pods that look like pea pods and um, rhizomous roots again and you can see it on roadsides and meadows and it attracts all sorts of bees and butterflies. Now you have the geraniums and um, I'll talk about a couple here. You have the dove's foot cranes bill which is around April to September. Uh, pink flowers, it's an annual um, which germinates in autumn. It's a small plant which produces one or maybe two flowers in a stem and it likes to grow on dry grassland. It produces a lot of seeds when it dies. Uh, the cut leaf cranes bill, we can see it May to August. It's a short to medium hairy plant, also an annual. And it, the leaves are divided at the base and the sepals are densely hairy. And the pencil cranes bill is one that I've not heard before, but I wanted to put, put in this presentation. The common stalks bill, you can see it between May and August. It's quite a hairy one. Um, a great food plant for the brown argus. Um, it's an annual or biennial, so it takes two years to have its full life cycle. Um, it has five petaled flowers with panatified leaves. And buff-tailed and red-tailed bees like this plant. Next, we have the meadow cranes bill. Um, it has violet flowers with five petals. You can see it between June and August. Again, it's a perennial. Um, it likes meadows, road verges and grasslands. It's a popular plant in sunny spots and the bill likes seed pots, what gives it its name. Um, and it's quite rare in the southwest of England. Herb Robert is a lovely plant that is quite common. You can see it in various places between May and September. It has distinctive red stems and apparently able to treat nosebleeds and tummy upsets. And you, yeah, it has apparently got um, an unpleasant scent, but hoverflies love it. The rose family. Here we have creeping cinquefoil and tormentil, both together look incredibly similar. Like you have the five lobed leaves that are pinatified on both plants. But what does separate them is that cinquefoil has five yellow petals and tormentil only has four. So that's a really great way of differentiating the two. Um, and both are perennials and are seen between April and September. And you can see them on roadsides and meadows. So agrimony is next, also called church steeples. You can see it between June and September and the flowers are all connected via one tall stem. Um, it is a perennial that has rhizomes, and you can see it. And it's also used for insomnia, apparently. Um, next, we have wildflowers. Now, you can take wildflowers. You can eat a few, but you can't rip up the whole plant. It goes back to the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, and also leave some for wildlife. You can see it between April and August. Um, it has long fruiting runners and trefoil shaped leaves. And also, just a side note, don't eat what you can't identify. <laughs> salad burnet, you can put it in a salad. It's a low growing herb. You can see it between May and September. It has um, a leaf structure that has 
like six leaves opposite each other and then one on top of the stem. So 12 overall. Um, and when they smell, when, when they're crushed, they smell like cucumber. It's a perennial and it self seeds and it attracts all pollinators. Okay, now we go to the cabbage family. <laughs> so here we have watercress, garlic mustard, Bristol rockcress and large bittercress. So I will talk about Bristol rockcress first because it's nationally rare and only in the Avon Gorge. Um, the Latin name is Arabis scabra. Um, it was found by a very famous botanist called John Ray. It has small white flowers in the spring and it is very vulnerable to being shaded out by palm oak, um, leaf litter and ivy. So it is, it is a protective plant in North Somerset. Um, and also top right, we have garlic mustard, which also goes um, by Jack by the Hedge. Um, it likes shady places and can grow quite tall. It's um, particularly um, loved by the orange tipped butterfly. Um, it's a biennial, so it takes two years to complete its life cycle. And the small flowers appear in April. Next, we have the cuckoo flower, which is available from April to June. But depending on where you live in the UK, you, if you live up north, you'll see it later. It's a perennial and loves damp habitats and road verges. Um, and each flower has four petals and a rose and rosette leaves at the base. And then you have charlotte, which is quite a bristly plant. You can see it between May and August, part of the mustard family. Um, it has bright yellow leaves, <laughs> bright yellow flowers, which are four petaled, and the leaves are tubed. It's found on roadsides and waste ground, and the small and large white butterfly do like it too. Hairy bittercress um, is quite a common plant. It flowers almost all year round, so great for pollinators. It's quite a hairy plant, hence the name. It's a native annual or biennial, and it's edible in salads too. It's common in gardens, on paths, and waste grounds, and the leaves alternate. Um, and tiny white flowers turn into long seed pods, which then get burst into the environment. So next we have the campion family. Um, so we have white campion here, which is a perennial, but also can be seen as a, an annual. It has a balloon-like structure with um, a flower head on top of it. Um, it grows in fields and roadside verges and waste ground, and you can see it between May and October. It's, it's got a really good scent at night, so um, it can, it's a great food source for all the night flying moths. And here, bottom left, we have greater stitchwort, which is a perennial. It grows along road verges and grassy banks, has star-shaped white flowers, which are actually um, sort of cut down the middle. There's actually five petals that turn into 10 because they're deeply cut, um, deeply notched rather. Um, it's visited by bees, butterflies and hoverflies and a great food plant for the yellow underwing moths. Next, we have a common mouse here, which is a, another chickweed. Um, it's a really good source for insects. Um, the reason why it's called mouse ear is because of these 
hairy <laughs> mouse ear shaped leaves here. It is one of my favorite plants. It's quite small and dainty. And the white flowers are again, deeply notched. So it looks like there are more petals than there are. It's a great food source for insects and you can see it between April and September. And it loves to grow in meadows and waste ground. And it can also produce thousands of seeds. And lastly, we have common chickweed. And you can see this all year round. So it's great for pollinators. There's always some pollen. It again has the star white flowers um, and five petals are split again. It's an annual and it's found in meadows, road verges, gardens, and was used for feeding with for chickens. It's an annual with branching stems. Now this North Somerset Rewilding Champions project has been running since, well, the last two years really, um, with the pandemic getting in the way a little bit. Um, but we've been surveying five different areas, Western, Nelsey, Clevedon, Portishead and Worrell, since March till September. And we do wildflower surveys, pollinator surveys and insect surveys. Um, we have quadrats to um, survey the wildflowers. Uh, we do a walk for the pollinators and we sweep net all the insects. And we do cover the long grasses, the tree planted and the moon areas. So we do collect quite a lot of data and we have really fantastic rewilding champions that help us and they will be leading the survey sessions next year um, when the North Somerset Council takes over. And yes, do come along and join in and be part of citizen science. Uh, ways to get in touch are nsrewilding at avonwildlifetrust.org.uk or head to avonwildlifetrust.org.uk and srewilding to find out more information. Or you can go to the North Somerset Council's website, um, which is both linked together, and that's northsomerset.gov.uk. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>